Uh, hello, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming, especially today. And well, it's my great pleasure to introduce you, uh, Professor Vera Roshina, from the University of New uh, South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Uh, where her research interest is on different uh, fields as optimization, uh, convexity, geometry, am among others. And uh, uh, she has got uh, a lot of papers, more than 40 papers, 46 in your web page, to be <laughs> accurate, and very prestigious journals as mathematical programming, science journal of optimization, optimization, and among others. And uh, well, I would like to point out the fact that uh, she has moved uh, a lot around the world. Yeah? After uh, graduating in St. Petersburg, uh, he made, uh, she made uh, her thesis in Hong Kong, and then uh, she got a position, a postdoctoral position in Portugal, and after that she moved to Australia, and uh, <coughs> she is now uh, there until so far, until now. <laughs> In Chile also, I didn't know. <laughs> so it's uh, our pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, we are yours. Uh, thank you very much, Lola, for a uh, wonderful introduction. It is really great to see a lot of friends here and a lot of uh, faces that I haven't seen before. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Uh, so um, as Lola said in her very kind introduction, I work on um, convex geometry and optimization and things like this. And I'm mostly interested in actually understanding the structure of convex sets, mostly in finite dimensional spaces. So in this talk, I'm going to say some things that are a little bit old and some things that are more or less new. So it's based on collaboration with uh, several people. Uh, Bruno Lorenzo uh, from Japan. James Saunderson from Monash University in Australia, so he's also, um, he's very close to where I am. And Leventon Chell from the University of Waterloo in Canada. So they're different things and uh, some, most of them are quite new. And uh, the pitch that I wanted to make today is that I will talk about several ideas and then I want to s kind of make this claim that they are all related and there could be something that we don't know, some new definitions or something like this that could unify them. Right? And then there will be a lot of open problems and unsolved questions as well. So hopefully there will be something interesting for some of you. Okay. And uh, this is a very basic introduction. So of course for some people here, you may just fall asleep straight away, but hopefully you'll wake up later when I talk about uh, more involved things. So I'm interested in looking at the structure of convex cones. And uh, it's exactly the same. It's more or less the same as looking at the structure of convex sets. But uh, convex cones are important for uh, several reasons. Right? So first of all, we have uh, conic programming problems. So pretty much any convex optimization problem, or let's say any convex optimization problem, can be converted into this form, uh, where you have linear objective function. Uh, then everything here is in finite dimensions. Uh, some of the stuff can be done in infinite dimensions, but I, I talk about finite dimensional setting only. And then you have a linear constraint and a conic constraint. And of course, the advantage is that you have a dual problem that is explicit, right? So you actually write explicit dual problem. And when you have very good structure of your cone, uh, you usually know a lot about uh, the dual cone. So you can solve those problems using primal dual methods or you know, a lot of optimization techniques. And we have some standard cones like linear programming. We have the non-negative orthant. For semi-definite programming, we optimize over the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. There is a hyperbolic programming, which I like in particular, uh, because uh, it generalizes semi-definite programming. And that there's uh, very beautiful open problems there related to um, hyperbolic programming, right? The, the generalized Lax conjecture. And just it's a very beautiful formulation of conic programming problems. And of course, there's a lot of different, other different conic problems, uh, conic programming problems, uh, right, in modern optimization. Another take on cones, why cones, uh, convex cones are interesting is because in a different kind of take on optimization problem, global optimization problems, sometimes you look at a global optimization problem and what you want to do, it's a polynomial optimization problem. You want to certify that a polynomial is not negative. Right, so uh, we could think about uh, representing a polynomial as sum of squares of other polynomials to prove non-negativity. Right, it's a standard now standard approach in global optimization. 
So under this cone of um, squares of polynomials, uh, this SOS cone is a convex cone. Right? So it's a cone, but that lives in uh, the space of polynomials. There's other types of cones like SONC, it's uh, circuit polynomials, and so on. So uh, there's a lot of ways um, in which cones are important. And also, if you work on general convex sets, you can always take your convex set and lift it, and create a cone, and then you get kind of uh, compact objects, which is more convenient to deal with. OK, so I'm interested in the structure of convex cones. So that's my motivation. And I'm going to start with something that uh, most people in convex analysis know very well. And then hopefully I will make it to the point at which maybe some people wouldn't know those things and they would be new. So let's start with faces, right? So we take a convex set. So everybody here is uh, from uh, um, optimization and operations research, right? So everybody knows what a convex set is and things like this, right? So, um, right? so just a quick reminder that we have a definition of a face, right? So faces are the only structural elements of convex sets we have. We have no other things, right, in a convex set to deal with the structure of the convex set, only faces. And uh, so we say that um, a face, a convex subset of a convex set is a face. If, um, if I pick, right, so if I have something like this, for example, right, so if I pick a point on my face, so say I want to show that this is a face of my set C, if I pick a point on the face and then I pick any element in my set C such that this point X is on a line segment uh, in the interior of a line segment connecting two points in C, then this whole line segment should be inside my face, right? So it's a very natural definition that really identifies those structural elements of the set. Okay, now the first thing that happens, uh, the bad thing that happens with the structure. So of course I want to study the structure of a convex set or a convex cone. I want to see how to describe that something is going wrong, right? Something is bad about the structure. So a ba very basic thing that can go wrong with the structure is that you can have a face that is not exposed, right? So what it means is that if you have a polyhedral set, um, you actually would have a different definition of a face, right? If my set is polyhedral, then I define a face as um, something that can be cut off this set uh, with a supporting hyperplane, right? So I can always, every face I can cut off uh, with a hyperplane that has the set on the, uh, one side of this hyperplane. So for polyhedral sets, you don't, need, you don't need this definition. But what happens for general convex sets is that you can have an unexposed face. So some faces of convex sets, you actually cannot obtain like this, right? So it's a very basic example of an unexposed face. I take a convex set that is the convex hull of a disk and an additional point, right? And this point here is a face by the definition of a face, right? Because there's no line segment that has it in interior. And then of course there's no, there's only one supporting line to this set that goes through this point and it uh, cuts off more than I want. And the same for this cone, right? So it has an unexposed face. So, um, uh, very uh, common cones that we use in optimization, non-negative orthant, which is um, polyhedral, cone of positive semi-definite matrices, they're facially exposed. Hyperbolicity cones that are more general than both are also facially exposed. It's a famous result by Jim Renegar. He proved that hyperbolicity cones are facially exposed. There's kind of non-trivial mathematics behind it. Okay, that's property number one. You see I have numbers, so there will be a lot of numbers. So that's a first basic property, and maybe I will write it here on the board so we can keep track. Facial exposure. So that is very classic. It's in the book of Rockefeller. In the book of Rockefeller, the example of a non-exposed um, set, uh, if you probably, most of you will remember, it's a, um, you take like a donut and then you take the convex hull Right, and then uh, you have unexposed faces kind of on the top of this donut. Okay, but this is, this is simpler than Rockefeller's example. Okay, so now, uh, one thing about facial exposure is that if you cut your cone, uh, you get a facially exposed set. So, oh. uh, so, so, um, right, so, of course, our cones and convex sets are somehow interchangeable. 
if I take a convex set, but uh, if I don't like if I don't like working with uh, general sets, I can always convert it into a cone. Right? I take so the, the well-known trick. Take my set uh, in R n. Add one more dimension, and then this is one here. I take the conic hull and I get a cone and I work with the cone. Right, so in particular, if the set was unbounded, right, I will still construct a cone, but somehow it, 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 things get more compact than right, in, in the general setting. So uh, slices um, and cones, well, I can cut my cone. Right? I can take a cone and I can cut it. So I can cut it like this with a hyperplane or I can cut it with a lower dimensional space. It's a very nice example here of an elliptop, right? So if you, if you slice a cone of positive semi-definite matrices with a linear space, right? So you put once on the diagonal and then you sketch it in three dimensions, you get a beautiful set that is called an elliptop. Okay, so a facial exposure of cones and uh, cuts of convex cones um, are equivalent. So facially exposed cuts, uh, facially exposed cone. Uh, this is important because later we'll be talking about properties that have some subtlety. They're different in four dimensional spaces, but they're the same in three dimensions. And to understand the, how things work in four dimensions, you actually need to do a lot of cutting, right? So it's important to know that some properties are the same uh, for three and four dimensions. Okay, so the second property is out of the properties I'm introducing, it's least counterintuitive, but it's also not, uh, it's not a very new thing. So um, I don't like providing explanations on this because the explanations are always a little bit cumbersome, but um, there's nothing I can do, right? So the property is horrible. So, but it's useful for some applications, right? So it's useful for a facial reduction algorithm. It's useful for some questions where you need to decide whether an image of some um, cones is closed, so it's, it's a useful property that comes from a lot of papers. So uh, what happens here? I have my cone K, um, I pick every face of the cone K, then I take the orthogonal complement to the face, so I take the linear subspace that is spanned by the face, take the orthogonal complement, and then I look at the sum, Minkowski sum of the orthogonal complement with a dual cone or polar cone, and I want this thing to be closed. Right, so that's a property. If this thing is closed, um, I call my cone uh, nice, officially dual complete. So in two dimensions, it's always closed. There's nothing interesting to see here. But uh, if we go, uh, everybody's okay with polars and the dual cones, right? Because everybody's uh, in convex analysis, right? Sorry? Okay, but then, you know, when you see it for the first time, it's difficult to yeah. somehow, uh, it's difficult, I think, to uh, follow, right? So, uh, and this is an example of something that is not closed. In fact, it's the same example as I had before. So, it's the same example as this one, right? So, I have um, this uh, convex set, it's an unexposed face and this cone. So, it's the same example. I have this cone. Uh, it's an ice cream cone with an additional ray. So now, how, how to see that this is not nice? It's, it's, it's kind of it's a difficult property to check, right? So what I do, I look at the face, so I take this two-dimensional face here. I take the orthogonal complement to the space, right? And then I take the polar cone, um, minus dual cone. I, I, I have polars on pictures because they are easier to draw, right? So, and then I want to add this polar cone uh, to this linear subspace. So what I do when I calculate Minkowski sums, right, whenever I calculate a Minkowski sum, I have a cone, I have some line. What I do geometrically, I take this cone and I drag it up and down right along this line. So uh, then what will happen when I drag it up, right, so I look at what happens around this point. Kind of this cut or section of the cone will get bigger and bigger and bigger. So if you think about this picture that way, what will happen here when I push it up is that sort of from this side things will be closed. It will be kind of this um, half plane maybe. And on this side I'm going to get, I'm going to feel somehow some kind of a tangent cone, or half of the tangent cone here. 
in the interior, but the boundary is never going to be there. So the sum is not going to be closed. So it's difficult to see on the picture, and also this property is difficult to check and difficult to characterize, because you have to check that something is closed, and it's, um, it's difficult. So there was a lot of um, kind of uh, work and conversation about how to characterize this property. Uh, we have some characterizations, and uh, so it's, it's very old news, right? Because I wanted to give a big picture, so this is a very old, res very old result. Uh, there is um, some kind of properties, right? So for example, we know that if the cone is nice, then it's facially exposed. So I can say that there's an arrow here. Um, that, that was proven by Pataki in 2013. We know that the other way around it doesn't work. So we have um, only in 3D, uh, those things are the same. Uh, and this is an example of a cone that is facially exposed but not nice. So it's a cut, three-dimensional cut of a four-dimensional cone that is facially exposed but not nice. Uh, some of you have probably seen it somewhere because it's not, it's not a new result. And there's some, some other properties. So for example, if K is facially exposed, that Pataki is a result. And for all faces of K, all properly minimal faces of the dual cones of the faces are exposed, then K is nice. But it's not a very nice, not a very easy property to check. So we have this. Now let's uh, continue to, uh, any questions or comments? Okay, uh, okay. So the next property, yes, let me also write, write the definitions quickly here. So here I have, well, facial exposure is clear, then this is F per plus K star is closed. So next, uh, uh, next property that tells us something about uh, how good is the structure of the set or a cone is amenability. And amenability was introduced by Bruno Lorenzo, by my collaborator, um, very recently. And uh, somehow I got very excited about this property because I thought that will explain a lot of things about convex cone. But it didn't, it just made things more complicated. So it's a new, difficult thing to study. So this property looks like this. Um, I will say that a face of a closed convex set is amenable. And uh, just for understanding, forget about the bounded set B. Right? Uh, there exists a constant such that the distance from x to the face is bounded linearly by the distance from x to the set C, but you only want to take x from the affine hull of the face. So, for example, if, if I take some weird set like this, I take maybe a set, convex set, that has a face like this, but maybe the set itself is like... Um, well, maybe like a cylinder or something like this, piece of a cylinder, maybe something here. Right, so I want to check if this face is amenable, then I will take the affine span of this face, and then I will be looking only at the points uh, from the affine span of the face, and then I will be comparing the distance to the face uh, with the distance to the cone. Right, so uh, it's not a problem, right, that here if I take some hyperplane here, that uh, I kind of don't have an error bound or something like this here. I only care about points in the affine span of the face. So, and uh, Bruno introduced it to um, prove some error bound results for some convex cones. So I'm not really, I'm not that interested in error bounds, I'm interested in geometry. So I think geometric is a nice property. Okay, so we can define amenability for uh, convex sets and convex cones. And also, if we take cuts or lifts, then amenability is preserved. And actually, it's not as trivial as facial exposure. So for facial exposure, it's really easy to see it's that things are the same. And there's some properties of amenable sets and cones. Okay. Uh, so let me... Yes, yeah, so let me... Uh, maybe let me pro first relate to other properties, and then I will talk a little bit about hyperbolicity cones. So... Now I put amenable here. And so amenable things are like this. So we have for the distance from x to the face is bounded by the distance from x to the set uh, for every x 
in the affine hull of F. And uh, what we have shown, um, so uh, Bruno Lorenz showed that amenable cones are nice. We have shown that nice cones are amenable only in 3D. So it's a completely different property to that other property of niceness, which was very weird because things looked very similar. So we thought, no, they should be the same, but they're not the same. And this is an example that shows that uh, things don't work in four-dimensional case. So what happens here? So uh, it's a cut, right? So it's a cut of a four-dimensional cone. So I have my cone in R4, and then I slice it in some way that is convenient for me. So the set that you see is this thing, right? So the set is in three-dimensional space, right? So I preserve a lot uh, of information about the cone. And then I can see that uh, this set is not amenable. So the way the set is constructed is just we took a cylinder, right? And then we added some curve to the cylinder on the outside, and then we took a convex hull. So we just needed to be careful with how this curve approaches the top, right? So because we want, then when we check amenability, it doesn't work because there's a problem with distances here when, where the curve approaches the set. So it's not amenable. Um, but then I will have shown that it's nice because for niceness, I want this property to hold. And then what happens is when you're checking this property for a phase of co-dimension one, uh, you can actually see that it holds on a dual object because you just need a closed cone of feasible directions for the dual object. So you take the dual phase. Uh, so this guy, I mean, y you don't need to check this property. You just take the dual object. So this is a cut of a dual cone. Uh, you look at the tip. The tip corresponds to the two-dimensional phase. You see that the cone of feasible directions is closed. And then you see that it's, um, it satisfies the niceness property. OK. But then we were working on this, and also my collaborator, Bruno, he's very good at literature. So I highly recommend him as a collaborator because he knows um, all literature, all possible literature, and he found more things in this literature. So he always finds more things. So uh, one of the things that he found was a completely different property, yet again. So you see that these things are so different. Like the way you define those um, structural properties of convex sets, they have uh, the definitions are completely, completely different. Okay, so um, uh, the, the, le the next property is projectional exposure. Okay, so um, we say that a cone is projectionally exposed if we can map the whole cone onto each one of the faces using a linear mapping. And we want a linear mapping that is a projection, but not necessarily an orthogonal projection. So, for example, every polyhedral cone is projectionally exposed. Some other nice, um, not nice cones, but some other well-known cones are projectionally exposed. And it's a very old property. I don't remember now where it was introduced, but I mean, already there's a result from 1988 relating facial exposure and projectional exposure. So it's a very well known, not very well known, but a very old property. And uh, it appears that this property is stronger than amenability. So it was proved by Bruno Lorenzo that it projectionally exposed uh, mean, leads to amenable. And then of course, uh, when we started working on this, we wanted to see what happens here. So I uh, is a thief and only if because we want to stop producing more properties, right? So it's insane that we have so many different properties and uh, the kind of, uh, we have this hierarchy of things. So projectionally exposed, let me put it here to remind everybody, it means that every face is um, a projection of uh, the cone. Or onto the linear span of the face. Okay, so, and then what happens is uh, we prove that these things are the same in four dimensions. So uh, this thing breaks, and then uh, my take on this is that, aha, things are getting more complicated. So, uh, you know, maybe, maybe there is something else there. So 
And uh, the proof is actually quite interesting. So the proof uh, belongs to Bruno mostly. So we, we, we found some uh, geometrical ideas, but then he found this very interesting result that uh, the conjugate phase of a projectionally exposed phase of co-dimension one um, is not a limit point of extreme rays. So what happens is if you want to show that um, a face is projectionally exposed, right, that you, it's not projectionally exposed. Then you just uh, show that it's a limit point of extreme rays. And the way it happens, uh, on this picture, for example, I can immediately see that the stop face is not projectionally exposed uh, because I take this conjugate or dual face, and then it is a limit point of extreme points, which correspond to extreme rays on the cone. Right, so I know that uh, this set cannot be projectionally exposed because this face is not projectionally exposed. So I cannot construct this um, um, mapping. And so what we proved is a little bit more than just saying that uh, things are like this in four dimensions. So what we have shown is that, um, first of all, some faces are easy. So if you think about the four-dimensional cone, how do we prove this? So traces of dimension one and two, it's easy to show that if they are amenable, then they're projectionally exposed. Uh, faces of dimension four, it's triviality, it's a cone. Uh, but then if we take faces of co-dimension one, then um, um, we can also show using this criterion that an amenable phase of co-dimension one is projectionally exposed. So for four dimensions, we exhaust all faces because we go one, two, three, and four. This is trivial, this is trivial, this is trivial. Uh, this is this uh, theorem, right, so we're done. But in dimensions five, of, of course, it already doesn't work because then I have one, two, three, four, and five. And then this is problematic, so we know, right? So, so if we have a counterexample here uh, that things are not the same, then we need a counterexample in five dimensions, and we know what, uh, what uh, features this counterexample should have, right? So a potential counterexample it should be in 5D. should be in 5D. And also we know that uh, the phase that should break this relation should be a three-dimensional phase. And the three-dimensional phase should break, should be the problem, let's say. So it is, of course, a lot more difficult because previously we had to deal with four dimensions, cones and four dimensions. You can see the geometry by taking cuts, even though for some of those properties that we consider, we don't actually have an equivalent definition of three dimensions. So it's like for facially exposed sets, uh, we know that we have a definition for a convex set and a convex cone. It's the same definition for facial exposure. It's the same for amenability, right? This property, when we look at something like this, it's exactly the same for cones and sets. But actually, for niceness, we don't have a definition for convex sets. It's only for cones. And projection exposed, also, we don't have a definition for convex sets. So, yeah, but, but uh, this is very complicated. We think we have an idea how to construct a counterexample, but we haven't actually worked through all the details. So I think, I think there should be, there should be a counterexample. Okay. So now moving on to a, a second theme somehow. So because um, I was trying to make this point that there's too much stuff here. There's too many different properties uh, defined very differently. And, uh, but on the other hand, uh, they follow from each other. So there could be something unifying. There could be something that um, some easy thing that we can say, well, if this inequality holds for some k here, m here, right, then we have this or, right, so, but I don't know, uh, for, for faces of a cone. So, but one thing that I can offer is from a different line of research. So this is a um, collaboration with uh, Leventon Chell from the University of Waterloo. So in this case, uh, what we wanted to do, we only wanted to focus on this niceness property, only on this one. And uh, we wanted to find the characterization for niceness 
Right, so the goal was to characterize this. But uh, in some sense, uh, using something more convenient than checking then that the sum is closed. So maybe what we found was less convenient than this, but that was the goal, right? To see, to kind of try to find another way to approach this. Maybe find a primal way to approach it, because at least uh, find something that wouldn't require um, wouldn't require us to construct a dual cone, right? Some primal characterization of this nicest property. So, uh, we define this uh, uh, property, tangential exposure. So what we do, we take the normal, well, sorry, tangent cone to the set. Um, yeah, so it's just a definition of a tangent cone. Right? You can take the cone of feasible directions for a convex set and take the closure, right? So it's standard thing in convex analysis. And then what we want for this tangential exposure property, we want the intersection of, of the tangent cone to our entire big cone K uh, with the linear span of the face to coincide with the tangent cone to the face hmm? for all faces. And let me show you how it breaks. Oh wait, I had to, ah yes, I had, yes, yeah, so how this breaks. So this is an example on which this property breaks, for example. There's probably easy examples than this. Right, so, um, again, I can work on slices. I don't have to work on right, four-dimensional cones or high-dimensional cones. So I, if I construct a tangent to the set, so the set, uh, it's uh, built from two pieces of curves that somehow live in those faces, right, of those two cubes. I hope that it, it makes sense, right, this uh, geometric picture. So if I construct, uh, the tangent cone to the set at this point, I'm actually going to get a kind of a half space, right, at this point. Not a half space, but, but um, let's say this half space will be inside the tangent cone, right, the way those things work here, right. You see this curve is tangential here, this curve is tangential here. So, but if I take this face and I construct a tangent to this face at this point, uh, then I'm only going to get um, kind of a quarter of a plane, so to say, right? So now if I intersect the tangent to the set with the um, affine hull or affine span of my face, then I'm not going to get the tangent to the face. So that is how this property is broken. So it's just to demonstrate the property. And we have shown that if a cone is nice, then for every face of this cone and every point in the face, we must have this tangential exposure property. Right, so if the cone is nice, uh, then we'll have tangential exposure. Okay, so that is useless, right? Because if you want to check niceness, okay, you can check that this is broken and maybe it's not nice, but we want to also check the other way around. And the other way around is a lot more complicated. So what I do, uh, so this is uh, an example uh, that shows that it's not even on the E. Right? So it doesn't work uh, this way. So for example, here, uh, this cone is uh, tangentially exposed, but it's not nice. So it's only, it's only a necessary condition. And then another thing that I was very excited about when I um, learned about this amenable property it was a very nice paper by Bruno Lorenzo. That is how I started collaborating with him because I thought that this property was exactly the same as this one, my property, but it wasn't. So it's a completely different thing. Okay, so now what we can do, we can define lexi lexicographic tangent cones. And then if, when I know that if somebody showed something like this to me, I would tell to this person that this is nonsense, right? So why would you do things like this? So you take, um, a tangent cone to a convex set, then you look at this tangent cone and at every point of this tangent cone, you take a tangent cone and then you continue like this, right? So, but I have a um, confirmation that it's not nonsense and the confirmation is by proof by authority, right? Because it's exactly, it's a, it's a very similar thing to lexicographic derivatives that were introduced by Nesrov. And lexicographic derivatives, you have a directional derivative of your function and then you keep taking directional derivatives of directional derivatives, right? So you go in different directions and you stop when you 
uh, reach a linear function. Right? Because eventually, if you keep taking directional derivatives, right, in different directions, you end up with a linear function. And then you just got all those linear functions and you get a lexicographic subdifferential. And the subdifferential is actually very interesting because, uh, for example, it doesn't have to be closed, right? And it looks different with um, other subdifferentials. So, but anyway, so it just, uh, it's uh, kind of um, not a motivation, but it's uh, kind of an argument that uh, says that maybe it's not too stupid to consider tangents of tangents. So, now, uh, we have this property that we call strongly tangentially, tangentially exposed set. And strongly tangentially exposed means that this property, uh, this tangential exposure, right, when I want my, the intersection of, um, of the tangent uh, with the affine span to, be to coincide with the tangent to the face. So I want this to be true for all tangents of all tangents and so on, right, forever, for the set. And then we know that if uh, a cone is strongly tangentially exposed, then it's nice. Right, so it's um, like this. Right, so strongly tangentially exposed uh, means that for, right, so this property holds for all tangents of tangents. But also we know that it's not, um, um, right, uh, it's not a necessary condition, because we also have some interesting examples there. So, uh, and this example is, um, I think, interesting not only because of it shows that uh, the properties are not the same, but because it shows that you can have a convex set that um, has better geometry than its tangent. Uh, because if I look at this convex set, right, so uh, the way it's constructed is just I take a um, uh, curve, right? I take a um, subset of a circle like this, um, like a quarter of a circle here, half of the circle at the bottom of the cylinder, take the convex hull, so I have a set like this. Uh, this set is facially exposed. And it has no problems with this uh, main property, facial exposure. Uh, I mean, I I the example shows something more complicated, but uh, what I'm talking about is more simple. And then if I take a tangent, at this point to the set, the tangent cone will look like this, right? So it's a cone, of course, that is continuous. Uh, so this is zero here. And then the tangent cone is not facially exposed because I generate this face here uh, that is not exposed. It's exposed in a, in a, in a um, original cone, but it's not exposed in the tangent. So tangent is not as good as uh, the actual original set. Uh, which is, uh, to me, is a little bit unexpected because you would think that tangents should be better than sets. They're kind of, I don't know, linearized object. Okay, so uh, let me go through some open problems and what we know. Um, yes, let me, let me go through this table. And then if I have time, I may talk about the amenability of uh, hybridity cones, or maybe I will not. So let's see. Okay, so um, I'll go back and talk about amenability of hyperbolicity cones because it's interesting. Okay, so uh, this is what uh, we think we know, right? So there's some, there's some question marks here. So uh, some of the properties that we have, as I told you, are not defined for convex sets. So it's not uh, quite a mathematical problem, right? Because the question is not mathematical. It's, uh, the question is about definitions. Give a reasonable definition of a property for a general convex set so that then if I leave this convex set, then uh, the cone will have this property, right? So we don't have good definitions of niceness and projection exposure. And it's not just something that I came up with. Uh, a lot of people discussed this, including Gabor Pataki, and we don't actually, nobody has an idea how to find a good way to define it. So it's probably not a very difficult question, but uh, you need some good ideas here. Um, now, uh, this is a very interesting question. So all of those properties, well, three of those properties, facial exposure, niceness, and amenability, is closed under finite intersections. Right, so if I take intersections of facially exposed sets, they're facially exposed, intersections of nice and nice, intersections of amenable are amenable, but we have no idea of projection exposed. Right, so if I have two cones, and I have this property that I can project on the whole cone onto every face, 
If I intersect those cones, I don't know. And the problem with proving this uh, is, is like, like this one. Right? So because I know that in four dimensions, projection exposed cones are amenable, then I wouldn't be able to find the current example in four dimensions. Right? Because if, if I have two projection exposed cones in four dimensions, <coughs> uh, they are amenable, so the intersection is projection exposed. Right? So the only counter example I can find potentially is in five dimensions. Um, uh, we still, there are some other results. So one result that I wanted to talk about is uh, whether high publicity cones are amenable. So I'll go back to that slide in a moment. And uh, some things we don't know. So for example, homogeneous cones, are they projectionally exposed? Uh, high publicity cones, uh, projectionally exposed, we don't know. And uh, high publicity cones are very important for a certain proportion of people working in kind of the intersection of algebraic geometry and convexity. So yes, I, I will. I will. I definitely have time to talk about it a little bit more. So uh, this is another picture that corresponds to this relation, right? And uh, this is another thing that corresponds to the relations between uh, different properties. And uh, this is another overview of open problems. Right? So are amenable cones projectionally exposed in five dimensions and higher? So we don't know. Um, High publicity cones projectionally exposed in five dimensions and higher, we don't know. Intersections of projection exposed cones, we don't know. It looks very simple, right? This projection exposure property, just project a cone onto the face. Um, again, what are the definitions of niceness and projection exposure for complex sets? And um, another thing is, can I relate uh, these things, these properties, uh, with everything else? Right? Because I only know how to relate those properties with niceness, but maybe there is something that describes amenability, projection exposure, and so on, in terms of some kind of tangent characterizations. And another more general thing that is also not a well-defined mathematical question is, again, whether I can find something that unifies all this uh, very messy stuff, right? Because there's so many things, and it just doesn't look reasonable to continue like this, because I'm sure Bruno will find more papers and then We'll continue proving things and then we should stop. Okay, so now let me go back to uh, high publicity cones. Yes, yeah, so <coughs> uh, I don't know if. Um, is anybody here particularly interested in high publicity? Does anybody work with high publicity? <laughs> okay, 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 okay. So, uh, personally, I find them, uh, um, I find the problems related to high publicity cones uh, pretty cool, right, and pretty fascinating. So, uh, high publicity cones generalize semi definite programming, for instance, uh, with a caveat. Has it to do with the hyperbolic geometry? No, 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 no. It's a completely, it's, a, it's misleading, right? Because it's yes. high publicity cones, yeah, it's, it's very misleading. So, uh, let me try to reproduce the definition. So, they are defined algebraically, they come from polynomials, right? So, I have a polynomial. It's polynomial of degree d, some fixed degree. It has to be homogeneous, unhomogeneous. Okay, so, and then I have another property, and I think I will first draw a picture and then explain the property. So, as I said, a high publicity cones, they generalize um, the negative orthon and semi definite programming. So, let's uh, start with a simple picture how they generalize the uh, non negative orthon and then go to the definition, right? So, if I take my non-negative orthon, say in two dimensions, x, y, <coughs> it lives in a complement of the variety of this polynomial. Right? So um, x, y equals zero. So the variety of this polynomial is x, y such that x, y equals zero. So of course, either x is zero or y is zero. Right? So, Another thing about this polynomial is that if I pick a point here, uh, some direction E here, 
And then I, well, I take anything else, x, y, some, somewhere else, and then I look at the restriction of this polynomial to this line. So I take p of x, y plus t, say, e, x, e, y. I should probably write a minus here. Yeah, let me write minus here. Minus here. So what I'm going to have is x minus t e x, or y minus t e y. So um, it's a triviality, but I will go into the definition of hyperbolic polynomials, and then it will not be a triviality anymore. So what happens here is that this polynomial has only real roots, and I can even simplify things. I take this e equals 1, 1. So let me put 1 here. So this polynomial has only real roots, and also the roots are non-negative, or the roots are positive, if and only if I'm in a non-negative orthon. Mm -hmm. right? So roots are real and positive uh, for points inside uh, right, this thing. So, but I can do it more generally. I just define a polynomial. So I go back to this general setting. I take a homogeneous polynomial, so it has all terms of the same degree d. So the variety of this polynomial is a cone. And then what I do, I say, OK, I want this p of x minus t to have real roots only. Uh, there's some also technical assumption p of e should be positive. A real roots only. And then what I also want, I want to define something like this non-negative orthon. So some lambda plus of p, that's a hyperbolicity cone such x that um, roots of L plus plus of p of x minus t e are positive. It's a very algebraic thing, right? You would look at this and you say, what does it have to do with convex analysis or convex geometry, right? Something purely algebraic. But these cones are always convex. Mm -hmm. So, and then they generalize semi-definite programming uh, because if you take um, the determinant, uh, you take the determinant of a positive, sem positive, you take the determinant of a symmetric matrix and then uh, this thing, uh, if you define the high publicity cone, it will give you the cone of positive semi definite matrices. Mm -hmm. So, an important thing about high publicity cones is that so you go from, you come from a completely algebraic definition that has nothing to do with uh, convexity. Then you define this cone, and then it's convex. It was, it's, it was well known for a very long time. It's a result by Gardner. It's, it's, it's a very long, it's a very old result. And then a lot of theory was developed by Renegar. So, and then it generalizes semi-definite programming. In fact, in three dimensions, um, uh, high publicity cones are semi-definite slices of semi-definite cones, right, in 3D. Um, it, it's, it's a little bit stronger than this, but um, let's, let, let's put it this way. Slices of semi-definite cones. So it's, uh, this, uh, this particular result, it was called Lux conjecture. It was proved maybe, I don't remember, maybe 15 years ago, something like this. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, there's a lot of things that I shouldn't be, shouldn't be telling everything in my talk, right? So, but now it's not known in higher dimensions. Unknown for uh, dimensions higher than three, right? For higher dimensions. So we know that uh, semi-definite programming, all spectrohedra, all feasible regions of semi-definite uh, programs, they are hyperbolic, right? So they can be represented in some sense using hyperbolic polynomials but we don't know if every 
High publicity cone can also be represented as SDP. And it's a major open problem uh, called generalized large conjecture. Uh, but let's say with people who are on the intersection of kind of computational algebraic geometry, polynomial optimization, and convexity, right? Okay, so now why do we want to study those high publicity cones and uh, look at all those properties? Because, of course, um, a naive view from our convex analysis perspective is that uh, what if we look at the high, publi at high publicity cone and we see that some property that works for semi-definite programming doesn't work for high publicity cone. And then it's like, aha, we know how to find a counterexample to this generalized slugs conjecture. Or if we find that some properties are the same, then it's kind of um, positive evidence that it may be true, right? So, and um, uh, one of the things that we did is to prove that high publicity cones are amenable. And in fact, that was uh, why we started collaborating. So that was the main, the first idea that we wanted to explore. I have high publicity cones amenable. And um, we proved it using a very interesting construction that is called the uh, derivative relaxation. So in addition to something like this, uh, what I can do, I can uh, construct a derivative relaxation. So for example, I take the non-negative orthand. So I'm here, right? I have my hyperbolic polynomial that looks like this. So I have my direction, I always have a direction, uh, one, one, one. So uh, this stuff defines a non-negative orthand in three dimensions. But then I can take a derivative. So what I do is I take, uh, let me think. Uh, um, I can actually just say that I take a directional derivative of this polynomial in the direction E. So I define a new polynomial. And that's just the directional derivative of p of x, y, z in my direction e. That's it. And what happens with this is it defines a relaxation to this cone. So if I take um, a directional derivative in direction e of the thing, I think what I get is something like this. x, y plus y, z plus um, x, z. Right? And then this is a hyperbolic polynomial in the same direction. And it defines a very nice relaxation to the original cone. So it's like a nice cream cone that is touching right, my uh, non-negative orthand at the, those points or those rays uh, where the polynomial has high multiplicity of roots. Or somehow, if you think about um, this, somehow points that are singular or have higher degree of whatever, right? So, and then uh, we could use those derivative relaxations to prove amenability. So what we did, we took several derivative relaxations until we got the one that we wanted, right? And the one that we wanted, it actually, it provides this um, kind of upper bound on the cone, and then it intersects, well, it, the, the span of the face intersects the thing on, in the interior, and then it's very easy to get some kind of an error bound that shows amenability. So we used a very particular thing that is very specific to a hyperbolic polynomial. Okay. So, okay, that's a, it is uh, 1.30 exactly. I think I should stop here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vera, for the nice talk. Uh, is there any question or comment? Yes. Okay, so you, you are uh, yeah. So you gave several definitions uh, like uh, uh, amenability, projectional exposure, it, yeah. exposure, etc., and, and niceness. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to propose another one which is likely to be a nonsense, mm -hmm. but I want to, want to know your opinion and if, if it makes some sense, how does it enter in your scheme mm -hmm. of those? Mm -hmm. We don't have enough things, we, we, we need more. Yeah, yes. I mm -hmm. will just propose one more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a modification of the definition of niceness. Mm -hmm. Instead of um, 
asking for the closure of uh, F orthogonal plus K polar. What if you ask for the closeness of F polar plus K polar? Uh, would it make any sense? No, it's a good question, probably. But it, it would be more general or less general or would it have any interest? I'm not sure. <laughs> good. Yeah, but it's a, it's a very good question. So okay. I don't have an answer, but it's a, it's a really good question. Okay, yeah. okay thank you. This is not to propose another definition. No? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Very nice talk. Thank you. Just I want to, I would like to ask you if the we can we speak about uh, if we we don't have a nice cone, if we if is there a way to make it nice? I mean, the way would be to make it smaller or. Okay. Again, <laughs> it's a fantastic question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no. I have no idea. I mean, uh, and my immediate reaction would be yes, make it smaller because then you, yeah. because it's all about right faces meeting at uh, bad angles. All of those properties somehow they are about that. So yeah, of course, if you make it kind of more uh, sharp, then yes, make it smaller in a sense. But it's a very good question to think about deeply, right? So yes, I would. My first reaction would be yes, let's make this smaller and then. But mm. yeah, I don't know. And my second question, is there a possibility to have an uh, analytic uh, definition? I mean, not dealing with cones, but with um, sublinear function. Or is, is it possible to think of uh, definition, parallel definition for I, function? I think that would be very interesting. Bin? Yeah. I think that's okay. a very, very interesting problem. Yeah. Because uh, already with Juan Enrique, we were talking about things like uh, yeah thinking about um, maximum one of operators and things like this. How, so how can you take those things, right, those definitions, those ideas, and uh, translate them to convex functions and things like this? But of course, right, the obvious thing would be to just take an epigraph and yeah. yes, but yeah, there could be something interesting. Okay, my question has to see with the amenability property. There was a, a set B in the definition that you said when the, the set, uh, okay. And after that you see, if C is a cone, the neighborhood B can be dropped. By, uh, why you call a neighborhood? Um, well, it's just a... Uh, no, it's just a because yeah, this because set should contain zero. Or I don't know why you call this. Okay, uh, a good question. Um, I don't have to call it neighborhood, right? Because the, 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 I mean, so the thing is the property is local, right? So okay. the property is local and the problem is the constant, right? So what can happen if I have a uh, convex set that is unbounded is that we even had an example. So an, an example was very simple. So. Uh, what can happen is that uh, somehow uh, if you don't introduce, um, I mean, it's not a neighborhood in terms of analysis, right? It just, uh, you just want to, to have a bound, right? You but, just want to have something. you are not uh, asserting that X must be in the interior or in the relative interior of B. No, no. 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 It's it just, just no. B. Yeah, so contains x but can be in the yes, boundary. For yes, instance. yes, because the only thing that we want to avoid here is to have an unbounded convex set yes. like this, right? And then uh, we want to avoid the situation in which this k uh -huh. is small here but it goes to infinity okay. uh, when we go to infinity here. So that's the only thing that, that happens. And if we work with cones, this doesn't happen because it, it's in a sense compact, right? So. Thank you very much for your nice talk. Um, <coughs> uh, at the beginning, uh, you say that um, it is it is better. Uh, it is uh, there are advantages of uh, working with uh, cones instead of uh, convex sets, <coughs> and there is a <coughs> sorry there is an advantage of 
working with uh, nice uh, cones instead of cones? Or do you know uh, any advantage of... of yes, so um, again, I'm not an expert on this because I'm interested in studying the properties rather than uh, going to how other people used it, right? But then uh, there's a lot of, um, there's first of all for reference, like uh, this paper has a lot of applications of nice cones, uh, but the things that I'm aware of are two things. So first of all, there's a facial reduction algorithm. So what happens if you have a um, uh, conic uh, programming problem? Um, so you like to look at the primal problem, right? So then um, you, you really want some kind of a slater condition here, right? For things to be nice, right? So you want, you want uh, this duality, you want your numerical methods to perform well and so on. So when there is no Slater condition, right, I don't have an interior point in the feasible set, then what I can do, I can, um, do, I can use facial reduction. And it especially works very well when the cone is the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. So I take my cone, right, I don't know, maybe some people are experts here on facial reduction because I'm definitely not, <laughs> right, so uh, I only know the very basic idea, right, so you take so say you have your cone, right? You have a face like this. And your linear subspace uh, intersects the cone along this face, right? So it's touching the boundary and you can somehow say, well, right, I don't have an interior intersection here, but I have an interior intersection with the face. So what you do, you replace the original problem uh, with the problem uh, on the face. So you replace K uh, with F. And then you have a Slater point at least in the relative interior of your cone. And then, if you want to do it automatically in a sense, then what you're doing, you're choosing normals, right, that uh, cut off this face, and you're choosing those normals from the dual cone. And when the cone is nice, you can choose those normals in an explicit way. And it's more difficult to do it when the cone is not nice. But um, I wouldn't be able to provide all the details here, right? <laughs> and then another thing is that there's some questions about um, Checking, right, so if your, if your convex set is not polyhedral, or no, let's, say, let's put it this way. If your cone is not polyhedral, then you will find the um, rejection of this cone that is not closed, right? So it's important somehow in some situations to check whether a projection of a convex set or a projection of a cone is closed. And there are some applications of niceness in that direction. So if the cone is nice, then in some dual situation, you can uh, verify that projections are closed in some way. So, yeah. So it's not, it's not entirely useless. Uh, there are some applications, but I'm not interested in them, right? Okay. I would like also to, to make a question. Um, imagine that your cone is uh, represented as a solution of a linear inequality system. Eh? homogeneous uh, linear inequality systems. In general, uh, if you have um, a good uh, representation, you could see that it provides a good set, but not the other way around. Uh, there are very uh, good sets, let's say, with very yeah, bad yeah. representations. So it would be perhaps interesting to know uh, whether a nice cone has a nice representation. Yes, it's a very nice, so it's, it's a very, very good point. It's somehow related to what Abdrahim was saying, right? That, uh, yeah. Just to, to throw yeah, it's a, it's a It's a very nice uh, comment, yeah. Okay. Any other question? I have also a very related to, to Juan the, about the relationship between, uh, for instance, in, in linear, uh, for linear systems, uh, linear inequality system, the relationship between uh, the representation and the, and, and the set of uh, feasible solutions. And uh, in, in this, uh, do you know, uh, this uh, kind of very uh, nice <laughs> properties uh, may have some local versions just to to look, uh, I don't know, uh, around some part of the uh, cones or, or the... In fact, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, for instance, to apply to some kind of constraint qualifications or something yeah. like that, uh, some, that to, to, to translate these uh, properties to uh, certain songs of the cones. Do you know about... Uh, 
Yes, the, because some of these uh, uh, properties uh, reminds of uh, mm -hmm. some constraint qualification, but uh, they are located in a in a point or around a point or something like that. Okay, uh, so again, it's a very good idea to actually have a look. Right, I don't I don't have um, much to say on this, but somehow uh, what you asked it reminds me about something that is um, that I, I can't say. Right, so, uh, so sometimes what happens is that, so of course uh, you look at all those properties and you can think about a cone that satisfies the properties or you can think about the face, yeah. right? So that is already relevant. And it's interesting also that uh, for some relations between properties, it's different faces somehow that, uh, yeah. that break the yeah. relations, right? So uh, for example, in, in here, uh, in, this, in this old example, so what happens is um, uh, when, so you, you, you break niceness, you say this, this is facially exposed but not nice. So the face that is not nice is uh, this face. Right? So this face breaks niceness, so you go to the dual picture, there's again this very strange behavior of the dual right extreme point. But then when you look at facial exposure of the set, the point that is weirdly facially exposed is this one. So the face that is, it is facially exposed, right? It's not a problem. But you see where the facial exposure is kind of weird, and it's weird at this point. So it has nothing to do with this face. This face is very well exposed, and so it's also this kind of thing, right? So if you stop thinking about the whole cone, and then you want to work with faces, then, and you look at, oh, which faces satisfy those properties, things get even more complicated, because sometimes it's different faces that you should look at to check that things work. Yeah, but okay, uh, any other question? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Vera. It has been a, a pleasure. But I, I would like also to point out that uh, even uh, Vera is here, but uh, tomorrow in Christmas Eve, she will be flying to Australia. <laughs> so <laughs> this is uh, another point to thank you uh, to be here. Well, uh, I'm also very grateful to you for accommodating me in this uh, very last week before Christmas. It was really nice to have an invitation to come and visit you. I've had a really great time, discussed a lot of mathematics. And it is my first trip uh, to outside of Australia. Uh, so I haven't traveled yet, so ah, you know, post-pandemic, post yes. -pandemic. Yeah, so, yes. So thank you very okay. much, everybody, for coming and for your very nice question. Thank you.